just said this is our fourth annual international conference for World Beyond War. Uh, our first two were held at American University in the United States. Our third one was in Toronto, Canada. And here is our fourth one in Europe. And we are hoping to continue to have our conferences every year around the world. And next year is going to be in Ottawa, Canada. When I received the Nobel Medal, I was petrified because I really didn't know what to do with it. But <laughs> when I studied what Alfred Nobel said over a hundred years ago, and a wonderful woman called Bertha von Suttner, who was the inspiration behind Nobel. And what she and he pulled together uh, was really a program that we are talking about today, uh, over a hundred years ago. So this, this is not new, this idea that we demilitarize and get rid of armies and solve our problems through not killing ourselves. There's nothing new to this idea. This idea is as old as the hills. It's just we have not figured out how exactly to do it. And we are not deeply committed enough, and the passion is not there, to actually know that peace is the only way for our survival. Yeah. So whenever uh, Alfred Nobel's will, stipulations, it's on the website, it would be given to those who would work for the abolition of armies. Those who would work for peace conferences dedicated to discussing and developing the science of peace. Those who would have worked for fraternity amongst the nations because they didn't believe in dividing the world in two so that people were being forced to choose who was your friend and who was your enemy. They didn't believe in that. And the peace movement of that generation, it's fascinating to read about it. The peace movement of that generation knew that it was the way forward. So it was a very popular movement. There was kings, there was queens, there was a high ranking officials. They were proud to be in the peace movement. They didn't go on television and talk about the glorification of war and who we could kill and not kill, and who were our enemies. They were very happy to be peace people. As Leah mentioned this morning, it's 18 years ago, about this time, stealth bombers from Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri invaded Afghanistan, invaded their airspace, the first U.S. forces into Afghanistan dropping bombs, uh, despite the fact there were no Afghans involved in, by any, in any way, uh, uh, in, in few Afghans were even aware of the terrible events in New York and Washington, D.C. three weeks before, on September 11th. Despite that, only one member of Congress, Representative Barbara Lee, voted against going to war, and she said, warned, counseled, that by going to the war, the U.S. might, she said, become the evil we deplore. Vice President Cheney, ironically, made a similar prediction that the, world, that the war that began that day, he said, might never end, but would become a permanent part of the way we live. He told reporters, the way I think of it, it's the new normal. And he predicted that Plans, he said that plans were being made to spread the war to 40 or 50 other countries. It was the same future of permanent war that, pre, that Representative Lee feared would be a dystopian horror that Vice President Cheney optimistically hailed as a bright new era of unlimited opportunities. 18 years later, the same 2001 authorization of the use of force that devastated Kabul is still in place, and the U.S. military is conducting so-called counter-terror activities in 76 countries, and the war has exceeded both Cheney's and Lee's expectations. This global war that began with bombs over Kabul was not intended to be won, resolved, or even contained in any way but it's carried out for the purpose of perpetuating it, and the cost of the war in deaths and dollars, and the fact that it is resulting in even more insecurity and more terrorism 
is not lost on those who stand to profit for, from it. The Church of England has 10 million invested in global arms trade. In 2019, Westminster Abbey, a church, hosted a bizarre and shameful a Thanksgiving celebration to mark the 50th anniversary of the UK's Trident nuclear submarine system. Armed with the kind of weapons infamous for indiscriminately killing 100,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Worse, even worse, the event took place in the presence of governmental, government ministers and the royal family, showcasing how political, social and even religious elites combined to glorify the weapons of ap apocalypse. Never. The military, dear friends, sucks the blood from the economy so, like some vast leech which leads to US and Western economies to crumble while it still continue to ask its governments for more jets, for more tanks, for more money to develop usable nuclear weapons. Well, the first thing we have to accept that this state, the Republic of Ireland, is not neutral. It's a US aircraft carrier. Over three million US troops have landed in Shannon Airport on their way to perpetual wars. And this state has helped the American Empire kill hundreds and thousands of men, women and children. And the six counties of Northern Ireland has been part of NATO since its foundation. That part of Ireland is a strong supporter of the use of nuclear weapons as a first strike weapon. As a consequence of the Lisbon Treaty, part of that was the thing called the PESCO, of the Permanent Structured Cooperation. Now what that meant was that groups of individual states, this is separate altogether now from the battle groups that Maraid mentioned, which was established a long time ago, but they only operated for a six month period. They were temporary. What the European Union has now done is established permanent military institutions. And different groups of states come together to form separate military formations. The German led, and there's one state of, of those group of states that, that, that lead it. In the case of Germany, the Romanians and the Czechs and the Dutch have allocated parts of their army to a European Union military formation under the leadership of Germany. That would be able to put permanently into a war situation an army of at least 20,000. The battle groups, for example, were only two to 3,000 strong. Now, given that every time you go to war, for every one soldier you send, you need another nine soldiers for backup. You know, soldiers have the problem, they tend to get killed or whatever, in wars. And therefore, you have in existence in 2020 or 2022, in one formation alone, a permanent, US, a permanent EU army of 200,000. And we know they want to create a European army because they tell us they want to create a European army. Let me quote the President of France, Mr. Macron, or President Macron, quote, we need a true European army to protect the continent with respect to China, Russia, and even the United States of America. Now, I assume President Macron is not stupid enough to want to go to war with Russia and China and the United States all at the same time. <laughs> Unless he's talking about a really, really, really big army, right? But it is a mindset that is absolutely disastrous, not just for the people of Ireland, but for the people of Spain and the people of Germany and the people of all the other EU states. We have been lobbying the Oireachtas, the Irish Parliament over the last couple of years. And one of the consequences of that was that an Oireachtas group, a parliamentary group of 44 members, 
or 45 members of Dáil Éireann to be members of the Peace, Neutrality and Disarmament Group, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, that is every trade union throughout the whole of Ireland, voted to campaign against PESCO, to vote against, to campaign actively against the process of the militarisation of the European Union. During the Europe elections to the European Parliament, for the first time, there was a relatively prolonged debate on national television, uh, on national radio, about the issue of neutrality. Now, we have paid uh, a, an independent uh, survey company on several occasions uh, to ask the Irish people what is their view on Irish neutrality. And the usual figure, like 58% of Irish people are against the use of Shannon Airport, uh, roughly the same number are against the European Army. Uh, but after that prolonged debate, the national radio station in our country, which is uh, RTE, uh, also uh, hired a private uh, Red Sea co uh, poll, they're called their, their polling company, and they asked after all this debate, what is your view on neutrality? And 82% su quote, supported Irish neutrality in all its aspects. So you could be looking at a situation where the British imperial state, as a consequence of the Brexit debate, breaks up into Ireland, into Scotland, maybe Wales and England. And of course I would contend that the end of the British imperial state will not just be good for the Irish people, it'll be good for the English people, it'll be good for the Scottish people, it'll be good for the Welsh people, because they won't be an empire any longer and they'll be able to spend more money on health and education. But I suppose, Shannon, in some ways, has been the public face of the breaches of Ireland's neutrality. Um, and I suppose the points I want to make today really are concentrating on the other side of the equation that maybe doesn't get as much attention. And that's the whole drive to EU militarisation. Because on the one hand, we've had successive Irish governments bending the knee to the American establishment, pretending that we're neutral, but letting hundreds of planes pass through Shannon every year with tens of thousands of troops on it and they pretend that these people are not engaged in any wartime activity, an absolute fallacy. Of course the cat is often let out of the bag by the likes of Mike Pence or the excellent work of WikiLeaks in revealing uh, the cables. But what is less concentrated on is the bending of the knee to the European establishment and the only people who have the brass neck to say that our neutrality isn't being eroded are Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. We had Micheál Martin during the European elections trying to tell us that it was a conspiracy to talk about a European army. I mean, seriously, this man, when the leader of his own group here said a European army of 20,000 people by 2024, let's do it. Uh, we know, of course, as well, that Fine Gael organised to get any reference to a European army taken out of the EPP election manifesto. So they, they know well what is going on here. And you only have to look at the election of Ursula von der Leyen uh, by a slight majority of MEPs here. This is a woman defence minister from Germany who's been quite open. She says the EU should increase funding in the areas of external border protection, internal security and defence related research and industrial development. She's actually been very upfront about the success that's already gone on on that. She tells us Europe has to build an army and then she says, well, sure, look, at, we should be proud of ourselves as well because it's already taking shape. She says now 25 countries have joined force in a security initiative we call PESCO. But the latest driver of war on a global scale is the arms industry and it is located here at the heart of the European Union and the Irish government, like many of its European peers, is a willing lapdog in wagging the tail of uh, that dog. And just to give you a few statistics on the scale of what's going on here. Between 2012 and 2017, the combined annual EU lobbying budget for the top 10 European arms companies increased from 2.8 million to 5.6 million. 
In 2015, the European Commission set up a group of personalities on research defence. Now, I'm not sure what the personalities were, if they were movie stars draped over bombs or exciting people or something. But in any case, their job is and was to advise on how the European Union can support uh, defence research programmes relevant to the common security and defence policy. And the group was heavily dominated by the arms industry itself. CEOs from MBDA, Indra, Saab, Airbus, BAE Systems, Leonardo, all the rest of them, the top of the European arms industry. And given that this is the advisory body, well, you can be very sure what type of advice they're going to come out with. It's a topic that's in the hearts and minds of Irish people. They love being neutral. They want to defend it. But the scale of how much that's been eroded has been kept from them by inadequate journalism and poor political representation. Um, and at the end of the 1950s, a crucial turn was made where uh, the Irish political establishment decided that economic independence, self-sufficiency, etc., these were no longer on in, in the Republic. Uh, and what we had to do was two things, embrace uh, foreign direct investment, particularly US direct investment, and become involved in uh, European uh, integration. And I'm interested in some of the elements that went into uh, that decision and some of the elements that have been work ever since it, which I think are not often brought out, um, which have produced the situation that we're in now, where we have all the things Roger and Claire are talking about, and those of us working against it, uh, the only metaphor I can use is the metaphor of being in a car wash, when you're in the car in the car wash, and these brushes are coming at you, okay? And it's as though you'd left a window open. It's difficult even to keep our intellectual and spiritual footing, if you like, in that situation. Um, and I'm wondering, and I'm interested in, why that's so. Why, for example, we've had in Ireland, particularly in the last five, six, seven, eight, ten years, uh, a, a, a huge increase of military grooming, not just of children, but of adults as well, were being groomed. I'm interested in the fact that, for example, we've already had, and we're going to have again next year, the Notre Dame, Notre Dame Navy match being played in Dublin, with huge teams being flown across the Atlantic, never mind global warming, uh, and military flyovers when it happens here. And I, I want to address why I can't find my footing to argue against that. Why within our culture, there's, oh, for God's sake, would you lighten up? You know, it's only a football match, okay? I want to get at what's the mystique, and think of it, Notre Dame, Navy. What's the mystique that's behind all this? And in case you think I'm being, as it were, anti-American, let me tell you we're talking in the country that in the 1830s uh, it gave the US the great present of Manifest Destiny, a Cork uh, emigrant who became a newspaper editor, John L. O'Sullivan in Texas. He first turned, used the term Manifest Destiny, and later in the 19th century, an Anglican, that is Episcopalian clergyman, developed the theology of the rapture. Someone said earlier, one good turn deserves another. Well, one bad turn deserves another, okay? So no one has any reason to be guilty where we, we, we've played our part in this. In fact, I have four grandchildren, and they are being taught to sing. Soldiers are we. That's the first sentence of the Irish national anthem. I've got an alternative. Soldiers are we. Uh, US uh, policy towards Iran has been hostile uh, dating back uh, many years. And it uh, started even before you had the current government. It uh, started in 1953. The problem that Iran has uh, is oil. Since the country has lots of oil, we have uh, governments like the U.S. government interested in sort of controlling who is uh, in charge there, who is uh, running the, the country. And uh, that's why maybe that uh, Iran was the first country that uh, experienced a CIA coup in 1953. In, in the 1970s, the U.S. government encouraged uh, Charles government to build 
uh, many, many uh, nuclear power reactors. Uh, they were saying that although Iran has oil, Iran uh, will run out of oil sooner or later. Iran was basically uh, a, a policeman in, in, in that part of the world. So when in Oman there were disturbances, on the request of the U.S. government, uh, Shah sent uh, troops to uh, Oman and basically saved the monarch. Iranian students uh, realized that uh, the Shah was going to be taken into the United States. They thought maybe the CIA is going to do in 1979 what they did in 1953, organize another coup. And they said that how the U.S. would do that, they said they would do it through the U.S. Embassy. So they had this idea of taking over the U.S. Embassy. Then you had uh, the Iran-Iraq war. What happened at that time was that, given the fact that uh, Iran uh, was this revolutionary type of government, uh, we had the monarchies in, in the Persian Gulf and, and the Arab world that thought if Shah could be overthrown, then they may be next. So they supported Saddam Hussein to attack Iran militarily. So Saddam attacked Iran using uh, billions of dollars that he got uh, from Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE. And what the U.S. government used to do at that time was to use uh, uh, satellite images that U.S. Uh, AVAX uh, uh, planes had, sort of uh, take pictures of uh, Iranian troop and sort of ir Iranian cities uh, and would give that to Saddam Hussein. Uh, so Iran basically gave up its nuclear program, and the Obama administration promised to lift sanctions. And the agreement worked uh, for uh, about a year or so, until uh, President uh, Trump. The end result uh, is more sanctions, more devastation, more difficulties. Say, on behalf of 34 ordinary, 34 million ordinary Afghans. I would suggest that the politics that's needed to prevent a war catastrophe does not exist today. And therefore, we need to work extra hard. And these four little kids are part of our work in Kabul, Afghanistan. They attend a street kids school, and they are from four different ethnic groups. And on the palms of the hands, they have written uh, the word bus, which is really their uh, symbol for saying enough to war. Uh, I lean towards responding first to human needs, and then perhaps we can begin to tackle human rights. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, well, we all told story. Uh, has asked us to think about changing our own human consciousness and changing that consciousness from a law of violence to a law of love. It sounds simple, and with laws, we associate that with rights. Who has a right to what? Uh, who does the correct thing legally? Uh, so I would suggest that when we look at each and every one of the refugees, that we think firstly and respond to their human need uh, rather than their rights, because rights can be quite confusing. The global refugee crisis I see as the largest non-violent movement in history. If I were caught in the same situation as they, would I fight or would I flee? And I grew up in an environment, unfortunately the system of the world, that uh, it is weak to leave. It is stronger to fight back. And I thought maybe uh, that would be the case for most uh, people in war zones, but uh, really most of them choose what I see as a non-violent option. They flee. But I think uh, an existential threat is posed by the use of firefighting foam 
on United States military bases. And I mean an existential threat to all humanity. These chemicals are killing us. You know, the United States military, through its reckless use of these chemicals, which I'll explain shortly, is poisoning people. They dig massive craters. Sometimes the craters are 200 feet wide. This is routinely done across the world. They fill these craters that are a meter deep with jet fuel. They light them on fire and they douse them with hundreds and sometimes thousands of gallons of carcinogens that are then allowed to seep into the groundwater, which are then allowed to seep into the surface water, which are then allowed to seep into the sewer systems, which are then turned into sewer sludge and slathered on fields that poison food. And when that doesn't work, they incinerate it and we breathe it and we can't get rid of it. You know, the United States owns Germany, it seems, and, and the U.S. military wants to poison the German people if it does. Well, they can't. They poison the water and the land and the air in Germany. And meanwhile, the German people seem to accept it. Here they are celebrating 100 years of American military presence in Germany. Throughout the world, the United States has military hangars. They load the sprinkler systems of these hangars with thousands of gallons of water and foam. They mixed it, and they are able to cover a two-acre hangar, 17 feet of foam, in two minutes or less. And they do it routinely, just to make sure that if there ever is a $120 million F-35 that catches on fire, well, they can put it out in a few seconds. And they've made a calculation, and that calculation is simply that the value of an F-35 far exceeds the value of human life around the world. They're poisoning the Okinawan people. And you should see the picture from the air. I have it on a slide where they show, um, where it shows clearly the landing strip in Futenma and in Kadena, where the people live on top of, of, of the military base. And the routine use of this stuff poisons the water, and it poisons the groundwater, and the people are drinking the water and becoming sick. The majority of us do not own shares in Shell, BP, Raytheon, Halliburton, shares that skyrocketed, including Raytheon, threefold since the Syrian proxy war begun. The majority of us, the, 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 the majority of us know that the major U.S. military firms are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, BAE Systems, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Airbus, Thames. The general public do not benefit from the massive tax expenditure incurred by these wars. In the end, these benefits are funneled towards the top. Shareholders benefit and the top 1% who run our media and the military industrial political complex will be the beneficiaries of war. So we find ourselves in a world of endless wars as large arms companies and the people who benefit the most have, have no financial incentives for peace in these countries. War suit them. People benefit from wars. The rich benefit from wars. And the poor pay the price in poverty and starvation. It is with great regret that the American people have paid a high price as has the Iraqis, Syrians, Libyans, Afghans, Somalis. But we must call it for what it is. America is a colonial power, much like the British Empire. They may not plant their flag or change the currency, 
But when you have 800 American bases in over 80 countries, and you can dictate what currency someone sells their oil in, and when you use the economic and financial banking system to cripple countries, and you push which leaders you wish to control a country, such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and now Venezuela, I feel it is Western imperialism with a modern twist. Ireland's neutrality places it in an important position. And arising out of the experience in peacemaking and conflict resolution in Northern Ireland, where I come from, and at home, it could be a mediator in general and complete disarmament and conflict resolution in other countries caught up in the tragedy of violence and war. It also has an important role in the upholding of the Good Friday Agreement and helping with the restoration of the Stormont Parliament in Northern Ireland. I'm very hopeful for the future and I believe if we reject militarism in its entirety, we want a demilitarized, unarmed world. We can do this together. Uh, a publication by the US Space Command in 19, uh, 1997, 1997. It was called Vision for 2020. And 2020 is next year. So their vision was for full spectrum dominance, as they called it. Dominance over land, sea, air, space, and information, interestingly enough. Um, and that's, um, that's fully underway now. So now the Earth is surrounded by hundreds of satellites, and many of them are run by or for the military, which uses them for all kinds of purposes, for surveillance, for communication, for global positioning, targeting missiles, drone operations, missile defense systems, and many more. Um, some of these pictures, I think, will be, probably be taken from satellites. In the preparation of every war, satellites will be used to take photographs of the places where the military will want to have to gain access or want to bomb or want to do something horrendous. So um, it's a really important place. And just to give an idea, I want to give an idea of the kind of thing that we're uh, faced with really, but then also at the end, the kinds of responses, the, the citizens' response to these things. So there are a, a world, there's a global kind of array of ground-based stations which have been established for tracking satellites and other space objects because the military wants to know what other countries' satellites are doing so that they can keep an eye on them too. So there's a global uh, network of those. There's also electronic spying, information, hacking, interception, a number of spy bases around the world. There's one also near where I live, Finding Dove is near where I live in, in, in England. Uh, the, one, the picture on the bottom right there is of Menworth Hill, which many of you may have heard of, a huge NSA spy base, which basically taps into every form of electronic communication that goes through the UK. Uh, there's others there, Waihopi in New Zealand, um, there's Pine Gap in Australia, uh, there's one in Sweden, uh, somewhere there, and um, Crown in Britain, another intelligent, uh, intelligence gathering, but also communication system. So another, another, yet another global network of um, these spy bases for hacking and interception. And of course, cyber warfare is becoming more and more important, more and more part of that more and more a threat to our existence because if you can hack into a nuclear weapon system then you can do all kinds of horrendous things. So I, I think the most rewarding thing for me is having 20 undergraduate students for 24 classes, 90 minutes each, where I get to talk about all the alternatives to war and how powerful that is. And it's, uh, they get it. Almost all of them get it. Uh, I've had a number of them uh, say it's really changed their thinking on whether they want to go into the military and so forth. Uh, if you can't uh, actually get paid to do this, which I feel very fortunate to be done, doing, uh, you can help uh, World Beyond War with, with our own online courses uh, to make this available to people, and there are people all over the world that take these things. Um, the goal being universal peace literacy. In particular, civilian unarmed peacekeeping. 
So the primary group in the world doing that right now is the Nonviolent Peace Force. Uh, they have projects in four places and about uh, 250 people. Uh, the idea of training civilians to go into areas of violent conflict where weapons are everywhere and training other civilians how to protect themselves. And I spent four months in South Sudan uh, doing this recently to learn how that model works and it, it really is beautiful. And it gives young people the excitement, the ones who don't want to just demonstrate but really want to deal with the question that keeps everybody behind militarism, that is what are you going to do about the bad guys? So the people that really want to approach the bad guys face to face, rifle butt to face, um, you can literally do this with the Nonviolent Peace Force. We train people to be proactive, uh, don't wait for the bad guys with guns to come to you, go to them first and see what their needs are and see if you can negotiate something. Uh, learn how to, uh, to hide when you need to hide, to stand up when you need to stand up, how to, where to go for safety, who, to, uh, who, to, uh, who your allies are and what you can do to stay safe proactively rather than run in fear. But the most amazing thing about being there was uh, seeing the, the local peacemakers already doing a lot of this stuff and not, they don't really know that they're doing it yet. They don't know where it fits into this big picture. And we can learn so much from them. Even though I was working with the Nonviolent Peace Force, I really brought the message of World Beyond War. Nobody's ever told them they won't want to end their war in South Sudan, but how they lit up when I say, no, we want to end war everywhere. It was a totally new concept to them, and they loved it. And it would be very easy to start chapters there. They would need some material help. But I left a few church uh, shirts. Um, there's somebody here that I met uh, who works for the UN, uh, Anne Marie in the back, who uh, actually uh, was there working with you and we met and she's going to take some more World Beyond War materials back to, to our friends there. NATO is an ex increasing obstacle to achieving world peace. Since the end of the Cold War, NATO has reinvented itself as a tool for military action by the international community, including promoting on the so-called War on Terror. In the reality, it is a vehicle for U.S. lead use of force with military bases in all countries. By passing the United Nations and the system of international law, accelerating militarization and escalating arms expenditure, NATO countries account for 75% of global military expenditure. Pursuing the expansionist agenda since 1991, designed to advance strategic and resources interest, NATO has waged war in the Balkans under the guise of so-called humanitarian war and was waged seven years of brutal war in Afghanistan. And now we are uh, preparing uh, the next actions against uh, NATO summit, next NATO summit, coming uh, in December this year in London. You know, we clearly live in a very, very dangerous uh, world at the moment, much more dangerous than at any other, at any time, um, I think we can talk about maybe since the um, sort of height of the Cold War crisis in the early 60s. Uh, but also it's a situation in which I think there are real openings and possibilities uh, in various places and in various times that we, that we should be able to, or that we, we need to think about uh, seizing um, in, the, in the struggle against war and, uh, uh, and imperialism. And the situation in Britain is one, um, as you've probably got some idea, uh, of you know really deep political and constitutional crisis P politics parliamentary politics is completely paralyzed partly um over the question of brexit it actually goes deeper than that um there is at the same time a real rage in society in british society against the um uh, political elites and the elites more widely uh, and just to give you one kind of uh, a sense of, of the depth of the situation. I think we're in a, a, a period in which the breakup of the United Kingdom is very, very likely. Yesterday there was a demonstration in Edinburgh uh, calling for independence for Scotland of 200,000 people, which is one of the biggest, I mean, it's one of the biggest demonstrations there's ever been in Scotland, and it's just like um, taking things to a completely different level. And um, there is, uh, you know, clearly the, the Brexit situation has opened up the possibility, at least a discussion 
about the possibility of United Ireland as well. So, I mean, we're in a very, very deeply um, crisis-ridden situation in Britain. And one, I think it's worth saying that one of the components of that, one of the things that's driving that crisis um, has been the legacy or the, the ongoing situation of Britain's close ties to the US and the kind of wars that it's been pursuing. You know, the Iraq war was a major... Um, kind of staging post, oh, so a deep sense that the political elites lied to the people, manipulated evidence, pursued a war that was not, uh, didn't have popular support, that Parliament went along with it. You know, that was definitely one of the moments at which the kind of political fabric in Britain started to uh, be torn up. So we have a situation now where the current government is, um, you know, is pursuing a a type of Brexit, a kind of Brexit, that would inevitably make Britain even closer than it already is to the US. It would tie Britain's foreign policy much more to the Trump project. You can see that already. Britain is the, probably the, mo the, the, the major non-Middle East country in the world that is edging towards the US position on Iran. Lightning. The other side of the picture is that we do have a, uh, and have had now for, 20 years and you know it goes back beyond that but specifically over the last sort of period of the war on terror a very very strong anti-war movement that has made a big impact on um british society um, over the the uh the israeli attack on lebanon in 2006 over afghanistan over syria libya um and so on there's a there's a there's a big kind of political movement in Britain that is opposed to these wars. What we did was we came here uh, in the middle of March on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, the night before St. Patrick's Day, we found out that there was an Omni aircraft that had landed at Shannon, uh, and we were sure that it was carrying U.S. troops and their weapons on their way to Kuwait, specifically. Uh, we had that information. Uh, Ken and I decided to make our way onto the airfield to inspect the plane, which is something that the Irish government is supposed to do, and they haven't. Not since 2001, when something like three million uh, U.S. troops have gone through Shannon with their weapons to wage war in the Middle East and uh, continue the process of uh, destroying the world that the U.S. military has been involved in. Uh, so we did make our way onto the airport that morning, and uh, we made our way towards the Omni aircraft plane. After about 20 minutes, the Garda came and uh, stopped us and held us, and uh, we were taken to uh, a Shannon Jail where we spent the night. Uh, we didn't expect to spend the next seven months in Ireland, but uh, after spending that night in Shannon Jail, we were sent to uh, Limerick Prison, where we spent the next 12 days until we went to the High Court to see if we could get bail. And we did get bail at the High Court, 2,500 uh, euros each. Uh, but they took our passports, and we are, ref we are supposed to stay away from any airport in Ireland. It is alleged that uh, we cut away through the fence uh, to get onto the airport, and it is also alleged that Tarek took obscene pleasure in cutting the fence. Involved, there are very simple ways to get involved, very simple little jobs people can do, even if they don't have much time, even just a little half an hour a week, there really are loads and loads of things that can be done to help make a saner world. and a world that possibly has a longer future than it looks like at the moment. But there's no point. Why should I tell you, anyone anything? I can give facts and figures, I can appeal to, and you'll say, oh yeah, I understand that, oh that's a good idea. It's head and heart, if I don't touch your heart, it's just irrelevant to tell you anything. I don't see the point in saying a single solitary thing. We were just, I just met these men in Ennis two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we were called terrorists. Ken and Tarek were called terrorists. And your one said you need to win the, the hearts and minds of people. I've lived, I worked in America, she said. You know, and it's true, people in Ireland love America. My mother grew up in America. My uncles live in Florida. I have an American passport. 
JFK, you name it, Ireland loves America. And anything that's seen as critical to America here is really, really taboo. We got some billboards put up for this conference, but we had to dilute the message. We had to take out the part about US military out of Shannon. We just had to stick with No War 2019, a little nice, clean promotion of the conference. So let me tell you a few things that might catch you in the gut. <laughs> so the number one defense of Shannon that I hear from anyone in this country whenever I talk about this thing is the jobs. Ah, but sure, it's a lot of jobs. It's good for the region. You know, we're making money. Well, before we helped blow Iraq to smithereens, we had an enormous export industry, or meat export industry to Iraq. Millions of euros, millions of euros every year. It was a huge industry. Zero. Gone. Finished. Doesn't exist. So don't be telling me it makes us money. All of those planes, you look at Ryanair or Delta, or I don't know what airplanes just came on, they all pay fees for every airport. Every plane that lands pays a flea. Not the US Army. The Irish taxpayer, if you're watching this online, do you realize this? We have paid 40 million euros, us, to have this fucking service here. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> They're not making us money. They're bleeding us some money. That's, that's our meat industry. The entire meat nearly shut down two weeks ago here in Ireland. The factory's all closed. So don't be telling me they make us money. They don't make us money at all. And even if they were making us billions, is blood money good? Is that allowed? You know, like for how many centuries did English soldiers come here? I don't think they were particularly bad people. But it was a job. And they came and they killed us. Is that, is that reason enough? Oh, it's a job. Oh, that, that's fine. It doesn't matter what color the blood is on the money. From the WikiLeaks cables that came out, I think it was 2006, I can't remember exactly, uh, we found out that the uh, US government, US Army, actually offered to stop using Shannon. They said, look, there's too many protests, it's too much hassle, we'll go. The Irish government said, no, don't go. We don't want the protesters to know they won. They don't want you to know. We won. And that's the reality. We have the power. Don't listen to their rubbish. We can do anything we want. If you think of any change that's ever happened in the world. Yeah, about monitoring and recording all of the landings at Shannon. We have data going back to 2008 about every plane that landed in Shannon. It will be useful. It will be important someday. It's, it's very important in the meantime just to, to be able to track and to expose what, what is really happening there. We photograph a lot of them, or I should say Ed here photographs a lot of them because um, he, he puts a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort into that, and it is really important. Witnessing and acknowledging and um, explaining what is what is happening and exposing that and we do that we highlight as much as we can with our limited resources what's going on at Shannon that I know that government officials read the stuff that we that we write I know that when stuff goes to the mainstream media even though they don't publish it it still gets read by somebody before it gets thrown in the bin or the wastebasket so it's worth, it's worth doing it. Um, it's always worth doing it because somebody somewhere is reading it and that drip feeding of information and awareness is, is really important. The other thing that, that matters is and that we do is, is regular ongoing protest. So we're going out there this afternoon. That's good. We do it the second Sunday of every month. It's becoming, it's, it has become a bit like a religious experience at this time. You know, we've, we've been doing it since early January 2008, I think. For one hour, we're there. Now, very often there are more Gardaí, more police there than there are activists. But, you know, again, they've got to notice us. We get support from people um, as, as they, they drive past even if they don't stop to, to spend time with us. And we do use the, the mechanisms that are available to us in terms of lobbying, you know, available at national, international level to hold the government, to hold the authorities accountable. I think Ed might speak a bit more about that. We also, of course, do direct action, which I think Ed will speak a bit more about as well, because that opens the doors to, to the courts, of course. Um, 
The problem is that it does come at a price, as Ken and Tarek know, because they're unable to return back to the United States to, to their families. So, so that is something that, that we always have to be mindful of. Um, but one of the key things for me is to have a range of tactics. We always need that. And we need to work together to put them to best effect. But Shannon and Ireland represent the local symptoms of the diseases that are wars, human rights abuses, environmental destruction, all driven by short-term human greed. This weekend, I was multitasking in a big way, apart from trying to set up the Shannon Peace Camp. On Friday night and Saturday morning, I was minding three of my grandchildren, three mischievous, healthy boys. The contrast between the well-being of my grandchildren and the suffering of millions of children in the Middle East is huge. So I want to make children the team of my short talk and also, hopefully, the team of our visit to Shannon in the afternoon. White children, well, they are the future of humanity, if they are to have a future. Ireland, by allowing the US to use Shannon Airport, is actively complicit in the deaths of up to one million children across the Middle East due to Middle East wars since the first Gulf War in 1991. Stalin is reputed to have said, one man's death is a tragedy. One million deaths is, are just statistics. This is a common human response, and it's partly a psychological protection for our minds. We can cope with individual tragedies, but our minds seek to blot out the reality of larger disasters. This is helped by cynical public relations exercises by military forces and governments. The killing of civilians are just collateral damage, and militarily necessary, of course, rather than the truth of unjustified atrocities. Stuff happens, I think, as Donald Rumsfeld once said. I will just cite one story to emphasize the reality of the deaths in these Middle East wars. In September 2017, I visited Syria on a fact-finding mission with other Irish peace activists, connected, in my case, with our Naming the Children project. Six months previously, on the 15th of April 2017, at least 80 children were killed in a horrific suicide bombing of a bus convoy at Al Rashidin near Aleppo. The buses carrying civilian evacuees from the besieged government-controlled towns of al Fua and Kafria were guarded by rebel fighters. The convoy appeared to have been deliberately delayed before entering government-controlled areas. A car stopped near the bus convoy and began distributing sweets and crisps to the children from the buses who had been starving for the previous two years. When they flocked around the car, the driver, who was a suicide bomber, activated a massive car bomb, which contained a huge amount of flammable explosives and liquids also. Six months later, we met a group of survivors from this dreadful bus bombing. One young teenage boy explained how he had lost friends and family members. A grandmother in her 70s, who was still obviously traumatized and in tears, told her she had lost seven members of her immediate family. Yet, she was thanking us for coming to Syria to hear her story. And it was deeply humbling experience for all of us. Those who committed this atrocity were directly or indirectly supporters, armed and funded by the US and its European, and including European Union and Middle Eastern allies in their attempts to overthrow the government of Syria in gross breach of the UN Charter and international law. Ireland and Shannon Airport facilitated and are still facilitating this and other war crimes. The US could not commit the crimes it is committing in the Middle East without the active support and complicity of most European countries, including Ireland. If we can take Ireland out of this axis of evil, then others may follow suit. If you haven't started or joined a World Beyond War chapter where you live, I encourage you to do so. It's really easy to do. And the same passion that brings us here today shines a light on whatever path we choose to follow or to create. It was once said that there is some magic in starting a new project. Make some magic. When you go home, think about getting involved or starting a World Beyond War chapter. So I was at the uh, World Beyond War chapter in Toronto last year, and I had the thought, everything was so inspiring, I had the thought, Maybe I'll start a chapter in, in South Georgian Bay. I, I don't 
I don't think anyone could have been happier with how the evening went. So we're on a roll. I honestly don't know where it, it'll go. If you told me a year ago that I'd be standing here talking to you now, I would have thought, mm -mm, are you, no. But I, 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 I don't know where we'll be this time next year. I do know that there are a lot of us who are, did not know about CANSEC, which is the largest North American expo for um, um, suppliers to the military. And so I think there'll be a lot of us showing up in Ottawa next year um, for the conference next year. So it's exciting. And um, for those of you out there thinking about becoming a chapter coordinator, I, I, I can't, it, it's a, do it, just many, do it. Many, many children in these countries, the planes, the U.S. military planes, have gone through Shannon Airport, where hundreds of thousands of little children in these countries have been killed. We are here to say, Shannon, our port, Ireland is supposed to uphold its neutrality. And by carrying out these wars from Shannon, from Ireland, we are breaking our neutrality. We call on the Irish government to uphold it's, it's responsibility under international law and to stop U.S. military going through Shannon Airport to carry out wars on these countries. Yay. Not Yay. in our name. Not in our name. Not in our name. Does Ireland use our Shannon Airport to allow U.S. military planes to go out to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity. Yay. Passing and traffic blocking more important than the United Nations Charter no. than the Kellogg-Briand Pact, than the laws of the nations around this world against murder and torture and transport of victims to be tortured. Yeah. Which, yeah. How do you pick which laws to uphold? You pick the smallest laws, the least important laws, the weakest laws, and say, we are doing our job enforcing the laws. No, you're not. War is not legal. No. Shipping people to wars through here is not legal. Shipping no. weapons to wars through here is not legal. No. This is not law enforcement. This is gross violation of the law in the name Yay. of law enforcement. Yay. End this. Put an end to it. Join us. Walk together. Yay. 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 Join us. Could you please bring forward? Ban the wars. We will ban the wars someday. We will bend the